Welcome to tonight's ASES Virtual Fellows Conference. This is a 16-week virtual program under the leadership of our president, Dr. Bill Levine. Tonight's session is adhesive capsulitis and failed painful post-release patient. Our panelists are Dr. Mike Freehill, Justin Griffin. Dr. Navarro will not be able to join us because of a family emergency. Our moderator is Dr. Serena Namdari. And my name is Dr. Ranjan Gupta. I'm the chair of the Education Committee. I'm going to hand over the program to Dr. Namandari. And a reminder, please, if you have questions, please use the chat room, and we will be feeding our panelists the questions. Serena? Great. Um, yeah, it looks like we're up to about 20 participants, so I'll give it a minute. But before we start, you know, I'd like to thank uh, ASCS. I'd like to thank Dr. Levine, Dr. Mazaka, Dr. Gupta for organizing this, this program. I know it's been really helpful for our fellows that uh, just graduated and, you know, they were sure to log in uh, every Thursday that there was a program. And I know that our fellows this year are really excited about it and excited about the, the new curriculum that'll be uh, coming out uh, specifically for this year. Um, so, uh, Bill, do you think we're okay to start? Should I wait yeah, a little go, bit? I think it's okay. Go for it. Okay. Okay. So, um, let me see here. We'd like to thank uh, DJO for sponsoring this. And I'd like to introduce the panel. So, we have uh, Mike Freehill, who's um, at Stanford, recently moved from Ann Arbor. Uh, we have Justin Griffin, who's in Virginia Beach, uh, Virginia. Um, we had Ron Navarro, who unfortunately can't make it, but I'm sure Dr. Levine and Dr. Gupta will uh, fill in and give their input when, uh, when needed. Um, and so, you know, I think we're very lucky to be going to be shoulder surgeons. And if you're a fellow going into shoulder surgery, you're, you're incredibly lucky. There are a lot of sexy things that we do. And so if we think about some of the sexy things in shoulder surgery, we have cuff repair, which is pretty sexy. Um, we have shoulder arthroplasty, which is getting sexier every year. Um, we have the Mazaka AC reconstruction, which is a pretty sexy technique. Um, you have Runjan's hair, which uh, it looks like it's cut now, but also very sexy. Um, we have Griffin's blazer and scrub look, which is an, a new one that I wasn't quite familiar with, but I think that's gonna take the fashion world uh, hot. So we're proud of that. Um, we have Freehill's baseball card. So I learned that Mike, Mike Freehill is actually a professional baseball player. So that's pretty cool. And Ron Navarro hangs out with Shaq. So that's also pretty cool. So a lot of sexy things in, in shoulder surgery. Now, if we switch gears and we think about what's not sexy, what's not sexy is adhesive capsulitis, post-op stiffness, capsular release, and heterotopic bone. So these aren't sexy things. But um, what, I'll, what I'll submit to you is that your fellowship is not real. So what you're seeing in your fellowships is not a real experience. You're seeing people who have been in practice for many years doing tons of cases. They're seeing patients in clinic, booking, I don't know, anywhere from eight to 10 cases a day in clinic that um, has been, is full of self, uh, direct referral patients. Um, they're doing two rooms that are filled with great cases, shoulder arthroplasty, um, rotator cuff repairs. But when you go into practice, unless you're in a very unique situation, that is not the reality. Um, you know, my first day in practice in clinic, I saw uh, three patients. One was somebody who had cervical radiculopathy. The other was somebody who was confused that they were seeing a shoulder surgeon because they had a knee, they had a knee problem. And the third one was adhesive capsulitis. And, um, and you'll see a lot of adhesive capsulitis. And so it's important for you to get familiar with how to treat it because it is one of those problems that tortures not only the patient, but can also torture the surgeon. So, you know, we have three cases prepared. Um, I don't want to fly through these. I want to kind of take our time and not feel rushed um, getting through this program. Um, so with that said, why don't we start? So the first case is a 47-year-old female um, who's had right shoulder pain for two months, no trauma, uh, rates of pain at 8 out of 10, worse with activity, and complains that her, her motion has been getting worse, and she says, I have a rotator cuff tear. Um, she has a past medical history of Crohn's disease and hypothyroidism. She's on Remicade and Synthroid. And you can see her range of motion. So she's limited in uh, both her active and her passive range of motion. And so I, I want to stop there and just ask uh, Justin, 
you know, how do you actually go about in the clinic assessing somebody's motion? Like when you're in clinic, pretend I'm there and tell me how you go through the range of motion evaluation. Sure. So I think that for me, I do the range of motion every time the same. So I start with the patient facing me. I have them show me their active forward elevation, their active external rotation and internal rotation. And then if I'm not sure whether or not that's passive or active, then I generally will take their arms from them and test their internal rotation, test their external rotation, and compare it side to side to try to get a sense of what is normal. So that's typically how I assess the range of motion in the clinic. And then if you, if you notice that there's, is it important to you if there's a difference between their active and their passive range of motion? And if so, how does that change your, the differential diagnosis that you have in your head even before you look at any imaging? So generally, when I look at these patients, there's two things that I feel like typically cause a significant decrease in passive range of motion, and those are arthritis and frozen shoulder. And so when I see a decrease in the passive range of motion, I'm really alerted to that, and I'm looking at the fact that this is a 47-year-old female unless her x-rays show a significant amount of arthritis, then I would have a high suspicion for frozen shoulder in this situation. And so, yes, I would say that most of the time I'm really alert to that, especially when they start to show significant loss of that internal rotation, which is typically the first sign that you see in the office. Hey, Serena. Okay. The, the, yeah. You know, for me, the second I, 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 I do what uh, Justin said, I ask the patient to raise their arms. The second they have a difference in their range of motion, I immediately have them lay supine um, because uh, there's a huge difference between upright. What you are getting at is if they have a decreased motion, decreased range of motion in the upright position, it may be pain inhibited because of gravity. So if they lay them supine and now their active loss equals their passive loss, uh, and you block their scapula, and you can really see people, you guys all know this, people can cheat really well by moving their scapula and their body, and they want to please you and say, yeah, I've got great rotation. You lay them supine, and they're sitting at minus 30 degrees of ER, they have no IR, they've got 30 degrees of abduction, etc. So I think it's really important to lay them supine. The second someone doesn't have normal active motion in the upright position, you got to get them supine. And, and, you know, I think that's a great point. And Mike, you know, when, when you see somebody who has limitation in passive and active motion, so they're relatively the same limitation in both planes, someone like this who really can't get their arm up to about 90 degrees, how much stock do you, and they have pain, how much stock do you put in provocative tests like Hawkins, Nears, Jurgensen, Speed? How much, how much does that matter at that point? Uh, I, so it, it's a good question because I, I get outcomes on every patient. So before I go in the room, I have their ASCS done and I have their subjective shoulder value. But then the way that I do my motion is pretty much the constant score. So just what you said, I, I let them go active forward flexion first, then I'll do passive, then external, then abduction. Right when I think that this is uh, what, the way Justin pointed out, if I haven't looked at the images, but I have, you know, you have three things on your differential. And if you're limited and passive as well, it's either arthritis or frozen shoulder. I will pretty much limit the provocative maneuvers because most of the time they're going to be painful. I'll still get a dynamometer score for with Job's testing for my constant score so I can follow them. But all the other maneuvers that I might do, I, I, I pretty much limit. So, you know, Dr. Mazaka might ask us if he was here, what tortures us in the office? You know, one of the things that tortures me in the office is when a resident or a fellow sees the patient, they're in a lot of pain, they have bad passive range of motion, and then they list about 50 different provocative tests that they did and how they might be positive for a cuff tear or something. And, and that drives me crazy because as soon as somebody has limited passive external rotation, they have pain at the end ranges of motion, I kind of throw those tests out. Um, and don't really pay a lot of attention to them. So, you know, obviously we're in a um, symposium right now talking about adhesive capsulitis. So, you know, let's move on to the, to the imaging. You see the range of motion deficit. And so let me take you to the x-rays. So, um, Justin, anything um, you see there that's unusual or that worries you? So I, I see pretty standard imaging, a nice AP, gratia of the shoulder, 
scapular Y, a um, axillary view that looks very well centered. I don't see any significant uh, joint space loss. All those things would be encouraging to me that if this patient has severe loss of motion, she's a female in her middle ages, this would be highly suspicious for adhesive capsulitis. So no, I don't see anything that would be alarming for me there. Okay, great. So at that point, this has kind of sealed the deal for you. This is a frozen shoulder. Um, do you need any other information? If the clinical diagnosis meets the x-rays and the patient's story, and there's no overt weakness, as Dr. Levine suggested on supine examination and strength is okay, then no, I don't need any more information. I would treat this clinically like a frozen shoulder. All right, great. And so, so what I want to know from you is, how do you describe it to a patient? So how do you describe a frozen shoulder to the patient? That's a great question. I think that everybody develops their own language for how to communicate this well. I typically tell them really what I think it is, that, that this is, I show them a shoulder model. I bring out the shoulder model that shows them what's not seen on x-ray. And I say, underneath of all these rotator cuff structures, there's a very uh, inflamed capsule. If I looked in your shoulder right now, it'd be re very red and scarred in. And I believe you have a frozen shoulder. I typically tell them that there's three phases that this goes through and I go through that with them. And I encourage them that I think we can make this better with typically conservative management. So I go through that language of this is really scar words that they can really understand. And I try to put that in their own language. Okay. Uh, and it, that's great. Any, anybody else on the panel with anything different that they tell a patient to try to relay that what the, this diagnosis is? Okay. So it sounds like that's, that's pretty consistent. So is there any role then for advanced imaging and MRI? This patient came with an MRI and, and, you know, many, many patients do. And that's why she thought she had a cuff tear because she read the report which said that she had a low grade partial thickness supraspinatus tear. And she was told by her primary care doctor to go see a, a shoulder doctor for her cuff tear. So, um, but is there any role for this, for this imaging? Um, Mike. Yeah. So if, if this was the same patient and they didn't come for imaging and my, you know, working diagnosis and what I was treating initially was adhesive capsulitis, I would, you know, we're going to talk more about treatment, but I would send them on my initial treatment plan first. And if they didn't improve over a period of time, I, I would, I would get advanced imaging before I did anything further. But if they come with it, fine. But I'm not going to order it. Is there anything on their Sorry. exam that might? Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was, good. I was just going to say that sometimes what you'll find with these patients is that they'll come to you after this from a primary care doctor with their their primary care doctor giving them a subacromial injection even sometimes and you almost have to win their trust a little bit they've had an mri it shows a rotator cuff tear they think you're going to offer them surgery and i think this is where you have to win their trust and say listen i have a very significant understanding of what's going on with you and sometimes that's hard to do it takes a little bit of a dance with the patient to gain their trust that you might give them an injection for instance or a, a pt protocol that could change things and change their course for them yeah, I totally agree. I mean, this is one of those painful visits sometimes where, you know, you spend 30 minutes in the room with somebody trying to convince them that they no, don't need an operation. And sometimes they're really not happy to hear about it. Um, so, you know, I, I think some of the things that if you are going to look at an MRI for, for adhesive capsulitis, as no, noted, you'll see kind of fat infiltration and thickening of the rotator interval, which we'll see on that bottom right image and thickening of the, of the capsule. Um, if there is an effusion of some kind, you'll see decreased joint distension sometimes. Um, so, okay, so now we have a 47-year-old female. She's got what we think is a frozen shoulder. And so tell me about what your approach is to this patient um, in terms of treatment. So, Mike, what, what, are you, what are you doing with this patient? Hey, Serena, before you get to treatment, Joaquin, yeah. Joaquin's asked a question. Someone, let's say the same patient comes to your office, has the MRI, but has not had plain x-rays. Does everybody in the panel get plain x-rays in that setting, or do they say, I, I have enough information with the uh, advanced imaging study? The reverse question of, did you really need it? Um, uh, Mike, you want to answer that? Yeah, I, I always get 
at least two views. I just do a Grashy and an, an axillary view. I'm going to get that on every patient. Yeah, I always, I always get x-rays too. I mean, I think I'm always surprised that I can see arthritis better on an x-ray than I can on an MRI. And maybe that's my own deficiency, but sometimes I'll miss very small osteophytes or narrowing of the joint space on, um, uh, on an MRI. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so Mike, uh, back to you. Tell me about um, how you're treating this patient. So you've already convinced her, you went through Justin's spiel with the patient and you convinced the patient that this is a frozen shoulder and that you are not an idiot. So how are you going to treat it? Yeah, so I think a, a big question that, that you get from the history and a lot of these patients, I'm sure we all see, they come in and they've had physical therapy, uh, a lot of physical therapy sometimes, and, and they're very frustrated because they'll report to you that physical therapy doesn't work. And a lot of times it's exacerbating the pain or they can't handle it. So the way that I attack these patients is if they're in the painful phase still, they haven't moved past the pain and they're just stiff, but they're, they're painful and stiff, then I will recommend an ultrasound guided injection into the glenohumeral joint. And then I will take them out of PT. Our, therapy, our, our physical therapists are so important to us, but in this particular case, I think it actually makes things worse. And I show them four exercises I actually had some pictures made just that they can do on their own. They act as their own physical therapist, three sets of, you know, they do three sets of these four exercises holding for 15 seconds. I take the time to go through it with them and that's how I send them off. The one other thing, if they do have a lot of internal rotation deficit at 90, then I add in sleeper stretch and adduction against resistance. So that's how I attack these patients. I tell them it's not gonna work overnight. They're gonna probably need at least six weeks and then I'll, then I'll have them back and check their motion. Any oral medication you give them? No, I don't. I, I, um, I put them on an oral um, anti-inflammatory and sometimes Serena, if I'm seeing the patient and they are um, hesitant about the cortisone injection, I will put them on a Medrol dose pack if they're super inflamed and painful. Uh, and sometimes that takes away their inflammation. It almost never improves their range of motion. And then they'll come back and say, I'm doing a lot better and their range of motion's no, not improved at all. Uh, and then they'll take the, the cortisone injection. But if they're super in painful, that can be a nice trick just to get them through that really inflammatory phase. Hey, Bill, if they- yeah, I do the if they get a quarter, if you if they take your uh, recommendation for a cortisone injection at that first visit, do you still put them on an oral as well, or is that what you use? I'll give them the prescription, Mike, and tell them that there's a, a small percentage of people who, that'll get a post rebound injection flare uh, of, of inflammation, and so that they have something just in case. Um, I don't put them on it routinely though, uh, but just so they have it. Uh, and I agree with you, I do an ultrasound guided injection myself, uh, but I disagree uh, slightly. I do send them all for physical therapy, uh, and, uh, but that's just a style thing. And, and I think that your point's well taken, whether they're doing the therapy or their therapist is doing it. My, my thought on that, Mike, and, and I'd be here, curious to hear your, your results, they got into this problem because they couldn't get their motion going because they had pain and they let it get frozen at the end of the day you know, that was how their brain handled their pain. And so I'm kind of skeptical that a patient who got there is going to then be able to unget there on their own when they're going to have a mechanical block that is going to be painful to get over, even with the cortisone. So uh, that's how, why I've always thought PT is so critical for these guys. Yeah, I need to look back. Uh, I talk about this with the fellows all the, uh, the time. I need to look back. The, the success rate is pretty good with them doing their own therapy um, and, and just the exercises I show them. But the, point, the big point of that is when you get to the point of the threshold of pain or the threshold that it's too tight, you back off just a smidge. So you're, 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 you're right at that brink. It's not painful, but you're right where it's starting to stretch. And my thought is that just like the natural history that these can take up to 12, 14, 16 months to, to resolve on their own. If you can just speed that up by gaining small millimeters of, 
motion, breaking up that capsule per week, you can get over it. But again, yeah, I agree with you. Um, it's maybe it's just my experience, but uh, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> question for so, the panel. So Bill, you. A question. Oh, for go ahead. Go ahead, Roger. Um, would anybody use PRP instead of steroids in this situation? Well, I, I mean, you're saying a, a platelet poor or a, you know a leukocyte poor or a leukocyte rich. A leukocyte rich, I would think, would would exacerbate it. A leukocyte poor, I guess you could make an argument for, but I personally wouldn't do it. I have I have never done it, Ranjan. But I I, I, I I'm just putting it out there. I think this is one of the times where I would urge people not to use PRP above all else. Because I think you're going to make them worse. I agree. And, yeah, I and I'm not aware of any, any good data on that either. No. Right. I mean, people use it for a lot of things, but this is one specific indication which I'd urge the fellows don't use it. So, so Bill, you, you brought up the therapy. Um, you know, one of the things as people go into practice, they, you know, they take for granted how to actually write a therapy prescription. What do you write on your prescription to the therapist when you're sending somebody for adhesive capsulitis? Um, I have a, a, a standard uh, protocol that it's not just writing the prescription. And I think that uh, hopefully the fellow, the, these are the new fellows coming in, but I see on the list that's some of the old fellows that are just starting practice. And so hopefully you pilfered everything you could from Serena and from the guys before you left your fellowship, because that's one of the valuable things you want to do. Um, so you want to know how to write it. So it's going to be physical. I, I do a frozen, frozen shoulder therapy protocol, which means at minimum three times a week for six weeks uh, with instruction in a home stretching uh, program and talk specifically about forward elevation, external rotation at the side, external rotation and abduction, internal rotation, um, and then teaching the, the, the patient the home program. And then the other part of the puzzle, and Mike, this gets back to the whole issue about doing it on your own, because uh, I don't believe that they really can. Um, and so I asked them to bring a family member to physical therapy with them and have them get instructed into how to safely stretch them at home to get beyond that pain point. Um, and so that's all part of the protocol that we send Serena with the actual prescription. So we've got uh, outlined in a, a whole protocol on uh, uh, frozen, frozen shoulder PT. And, you know, I heard you, both you and, and Mike do ultrasound guided injections in the glenohumeral joint. Um, I, I don't personally, I, I do them in the office, uh, ultra, non-ultrasound guided. I try to get in the glenohumeral joint, but I certainly probably miss and, and end up pericapsular or, or subacromial sometimes. You know, the data is kind of controversial on that. Um, and some studies show it doesn't matter. Some studies show an advantage. It doesn't seem like any study shows an advantage to injecting the rotator interval under ultrasound. Justin, do you inject under ultrasound or do you, um, do you do it blind? No, I'm not. I'm probably a little bit overconfident, but I feel like I can pretty reliably get in there. And I haven't had a lot of patients come back and tell me that it didn't work. So I typically don't use ultrasound for this particular injections. I do for the biceps and for the AC joint. Okay. So before we move on with this patient, Justin, um, this patient asks you, what are the chances that I'm going to get better without surgery and how long is it going to take? So the number I quote to them is typically 70% patients are better and that I can get them better without needing surgery. And, um, and then I tell them that they will likely feel better when I see them back in six weeks after completion of physical therapy after the injection. And sometimes some patients need an additional injection at that point in time. Um, but I tell them that typically within three months, they'll regain their range of motion. Mike, are you similar or do you, do you say something different in terms of chances they'll get better without surgery and how long it's going to take? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, if you look at those natural history studies uh, out of uh, Finland has, you know, the, the best ones that I know of, and those are the ones that take out over a year. But, you know, I, I think that in my experience, what I share with them is that the, the literature says that it can take up to a year, but in, in, in everybody's different. And if you stay dedicated to the stretches that, you know, it could take up to six months, but I anticipate that in 90% of the, the individuals that they avoid surgery and the range of motion does come back. But I, you know, I think we're going to get into this conversation more and I'd love to hear everyone's opinion 
but I, I do think that there's different uh, patients with different uh, occupations and different timelines that you have to take into account. One person, if they're not, if it's not coming back in three months, they're going to push uh, to have something done. Another person that's a little more sedentary uh, might be willing to wait the year, and, and sometimes it takes that long. Well, Serena, I'm I'm glad that Freehill read my article and that Griffin didn't. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> 90 our natural history study was that 90 percent of patients will get better with non-operative management uh, and uh, I think it's a pretty good study um, and but it can take up to six months what the key number though guys is that if you've got a patient who has been getting treatment for four months and that treatment has included therapy home stretching plus an intraarticular cortisone injection and at four months following the treatment onset, they're either no better or they're regressing. That's the 10% non-responder population. So you don't have to usually wait for six, nine, or 10 months of that group. And they're actually often going in the wrong direction. They're probably those that are declaring they're going to fail the non-operative pathway. Question for the group from the, from the chat room. If a patient is diabetic, does the panel still inject steroids? Are there any worries about hyperglycemia and any experience with injected keto or lac? Uh, we, we actually did a study where we looked at elevations in blood uh, sugar post-injection. Joe Boot uh, was the lead author on it. But um, in insulin-dependent patients, it has a greater tendency to rise. Um, and in some of those patients, if they're brittle, it can rise substantially. But the likelihood is very low. It's, it was under 10% and way under um, 5% that it would be something that would necessitate like an ER visit. Um, I don't have any experience injecting Toradol. Corona, is that, were the, was that study subacromial injections or intraarticular? Or they were assumed to be intraarticular, but likely they were both. They were not under ultrasound. Um, so in the interest of time, let's move on. So she, you know, I gave her an injection in the office, send her for physical therapy. Um, the ejection helped for a while, um, but then she comes back at three months and she says it still hurts. Um, it's maybe 50% better. And you can that's see the change in her range of motion. Was, that's because it was in the subacromial space. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so, so, so she comes back and that's what she says. So, you know, at this point, Bill, um, would you inject her intraarticularly? Or, I mean, would you tell her to keep going non-operatively? Would you offer her something surgical at this point? It's been three months. Well, you know, all kidding aside, 80% of glenohumeral injections are missed without ultrasound guidance in, in several studies. So I think that the fact that good shoulder surgeons and outstanding shoulder surgeons still miss a, a, a high percentage, uh, much different than subacromial. Um, so if I, I would give it, a, I would certainly do an ultrasound guided and make sure you're in the glenohumeral joint and give it one more chance. And if then they fail that one, then I think this is a surgical candidate as we were talking about. Okay, so I'd like to keep going. And so she actually had an MUA. She went somewhere else. She said, your steroid injection wasn't in the joint and um, I want this better faster. So she went elsewhere, she had an MUA done. Um, and then she came back three months later. She said, I'm still stiff and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sorry. Um, I went for it. So now you can see her motion. You know, it's pretty much similar to what she was at um, three months earlier. So, um, you know, my question is, um, you know, do you guys ever do MUAs for frozen shoulder or do you always do a capsular release? Um, anybody do MUAs on the panel? No. No. Nobody. No. Okay. And so, so it, why? You know, uh, Justin, why don't you do an MUA? Because the literature, I mean, the results aren't bad with an MUA. And if you look at the data, it actually can be fairly similar results to a capsular release. You're absolutely right. And I think that it's, it's something that many patients you'll, come, you'll have come in and they'll say, I had this done where I had an MUA on the other side and I did very well with that. Why do you need to do surgery? And so I think it's a challenging question. Um, I personally feel like I'm really trying, as, as, uh, as was suggested, in these patients that have recurrence to say, 
let's try an injection. Let's try something that we think will work. And if it doesn't, then I think that surgery is going to be much more definitive. And I feel like I can do a very low risk capsular release with a gentle manipulation and, and achieve very high results in that. And so for that reason, I just haven't moved towards using an MUA alone. And I worry about some of the risks of that. I personally worry about the risks of fracture. I worry about the risks of an incomplete release. And so for those reasons, I don't trust myself to simply do a blind manipulation in these patients. Serena, when I was the uh, ASCS traveling fellow and had the, the privilege of spending time in Reading, England with Steve Copeland and Ofer Levy, they would have a day where they would save up all their manipulations and it was like a machine. And they would come in, they'd get blocked, they'd manipulate them, they'd come in, get blocked, and they would do 20 in a day. And uh, it was impressive. And, and, you know, they had it down where their results were as good as doing an arthroscopic capsule release. So your point's a good one. Uh, I think it's more elegant and meticulous to be able to take the scar tissue out and make sure you've taken a swath of tissue out, et cetera, to try to prevent recurrence. But you, you make a good argument. <laughs> I think it's so, a little you know, bit I think, uh, okay. a, uh, it, it's a little bit like using a, in my mind, using a sledgehammer to bash the door down and you end up in the room versus taking a key and unlocking the door and you're in the room. That's just my thought. I like, I like that analogy. That's pretty good. I mean, I think Justin read my mind. I mean, you know, I think the release that you get from an MUA, if you look at the data, is unpredictable. So sometimes you'll release the anterior capsule most commonly. You'll rarely release the superior capsule or the rotator interval. Um, and you'll sometimes release the posterior capsule. And iatrogenic injury can be high, 40% in some studies, and commonly it's labral pathology that's, that, that, that's the result. So I think that's the reason why many of us don't kind of run to that as our, as our first-line option. So, you know, this patient got stiff after the MUA, so she underwent a capsular release. And, you know, these are just the still photos, but I'll show you a video of a, of a different case. But, um, you know, there's the rotator interval, which is typically injected, erythematous, contracted. Um, I use a vapor device to um, release the interval. Um, you'll see it in the video, but I think it's really important to make sure you're through the interval. And the only way you really know that you're through the interval is by identifying the CA ligament. Um, and you can see it there along with the coracoid and the conjoint. Um, and then I do the capsule release anteriorly with a biter device and posteriorly if I, if, if I feel they need a posterior release based on internal rotation loss. Um, that's what you see there. And I always take pictures of it intraoperatively so I can show them and their therapists that they're capable of getting their motion. And so, you know, this is kind of a typical example. You'll see the, the, this patient's range of motion. You can see she's limited even when she's asleep. Um, and, you know, abduction is limited or forward flexion is limited. And you'll see she's got a limitation in internal rotation. And so for me, this is somebody that gets, um, that gets a, a pretty much a full capsular release. And one of the things that I do worry about when I do this procedure is getting in the joint. And I've seen a lot of damage happen trying to get into the joint because it's very scarred in and stiff. Um, so this is us in the joint. I don't move around a lot once I'm in there and I identify something that I recognize, which is the interval, and um, then enter through the interval and with a, with a cannula. And so I think as soon as you get that something for outflow, you can get rid of all of that joint effusion and things start to look a lot more normal. Um, and then after that, I pretty much immediately take the cannula out because I don't think you can do a good capsular release with a cannula blocking you. And here's the interval release. You'll see that I use a vapor device um, or some sort of electric, uh, thermoelectrical device um, to release it. And um, you gotta really release all the bands that are connecting to the subscap. You'll see the, um, CA ligament is behind us here and it's open. And then there are usually these adhesions that are between the subscap superiorly um, and the capsule. And I've seen people burn the subscap doing this. So it's easier just to pull it out of the way and then turn on your burning device. And then here's the capsular release with a, with a biter. And so, you know, I just use a straight biter up top and that's going through middle glenohumeral ligament trying to stay about a centimeter or so off of the glenoid rim. And then as I get lower, I use an upbiting device and I have somebody distract the arm or pull on it laterally. And so commonly, um, if you use a shaver um, to resect some of the capsule, you'll see that you missed a layer because you really want to make sure that you identify the muscular portion of the subscapularis. If you don't see that, then you're not through the capsule. And so this is me going back and now releasing 
um, more capsules so that now you can see that um, subscapularis muscle behind it. And so that, that's the anterior release. I take that down to about, you know, 5.30, 6 o'clock, just to the kind of inferior part of the glenoid. Then I go posteriorly, open up posteriorly with a, with a shaver device, and then I commonly use electrocautery posteriorly. And, I, and similarly, I'll go down um, to somewhere around 7 o'clock maybe, um, and then do a gentle manipulation to release the very inferior part um, of the axillary recess. And so the other kind of important thing I think is that in idiopathic adhesive capsulitis, there's not usually much in the subacromial space. This is the subacromial space. There's really not a lot of adhesive bands anywhere. This is really an intraarticular problem. Um, that's different than kind of the problem that we may talk about next. Um, and, and this is the kind of gentle manipulation that I'll do after the release. And so I feel way more com comfortable doing a, a little bit of a manipulation after the capsule is almost all the way fully resected. And you can see that our, our motion's been pretty much um, restored to essentially normal um, after the release. So any, any comments from anybody on that technique and if, if they do anything dramatically different? So there's a question from the group, do you routinely add a subacromial decompression to your capsule release? I know in that case it wasn't there, but what about uh, other cases? And that's uh, from one of the fellows asking. Uh, for me personally, I, I, I don't. I mean, I go into the subacromial space, I view the ligament, the CA ligament. If it's very frayed and, and um, looks beat up, then I, I'll take it down and consider that. But to be honest with you, in idiopathic adhesive capsulitis, I very rarely will see that. Occasionally, they'll have a reactive bursitis that I'll just debride, but um, not much more than that for me. Anybody else? Yeah, I don't like to add another bleeding surface that potentially is going to be a scar, a, a point of uh, fibrosis. So I, I try to stay away from, uh, I'll, I'll put my scope in like you did to the subacromial space and just confirm that there's really nothing there. The only other thing I do technically a little different, Serena, maybe you do it and you just didn't show it, is that I'll take my interval release up to the top and then take it all the way back behind the biceps tendon to the posterior superior capsule, recreating the cleft between the superior cuff and the labrum. And then that kind of becomes, when I switch to the front uh, view, then that's where I then continue the posterior release down to posterior capsule and showing infraspinatus muscle fibers to know that my posterior capsule release is done. So just, just uh, I, I, you probably do it and just didn't show it, but that, that's one yeah. other thing that I, I try to do. So Rena, another question from one of the fellows. If this was the patient that had a previous MUA, would you be worried about adhesions in the subacromial space? That's a really good question. I mean, you know, I think it, it's certainly possible, um, but I, I, I this patient didn't, this patient did have a pre, or no, sorry, the other patient that I showed did have a pre, previous MUA, and there really wasn't anything substantial in that patient's subacromial space either. So I don't really think that the limiting factor is the subacromial space, even with an MUA, that, that space is pretty clear. So I don't think it leads to significant adhesions in that space. And okay. another question for the group, does a panel release the inferior capsule arthroscopically or release the inferior capsule by manipulation? So you saw how I did it. Um, Justin, Michael, any, anything? Do you guys release it directly under visualization? I actually do. And I was going to say the thing that I do a little bit differently here is I go through the pain of positioning these patients. Um, so I personally feel like I can get a very nice release all the way down circumferentially in the lateral position. The only two surgeries I do in the shoulder laterally are uh, are labral repairs and capsule release. Um, and so my personal feeling is I can get a more comprehensive release without a lot of traction on the arm in that position. And so for me personally, that's the way that I release in fairly. Great. Um, so, you know, post-release rehab, I think we all agree we'd get, get them back into rehab immediately. I'd like to move on a little bit, but uh, pain management, you know, I think Bill touched on that a little bit with the Medrol dose pack and the, and the um, injection. So, um, you know, she, she gets released and, and she ends up doing uh, pretty well and regains her range of motion. So um, the, I, one question is, can it recur? Uh, Bill, what do, you, what do you tell patients about recurrence risk after um, a capsular release? 
Uh, you know, it's, it's something I worry about. I especially worry about it in diabetics. And I worry about them getting not necessarily a global uh, recurrence, but sometimes they'll get just the posterior capsular contracture recurrence. And so there's a small percentage of patients where I've actually had to go back in and do a, re a revision posterior capsular release. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a small percentage of people that are going to recur, but we certainly tell them that it's a possibility. Great. Um, now, um, I'm going to have Michael kind of take the helm and uh, take us through this case, which is also something that um, you'll see post rotator cuff repair. So. All right. Sounds good. And uh, we can, you know, a lot of the things that were in the idiopathic uh, will we'll cross over here, but there's some differences that certainly I think will be interesting conversation. So this was a 58 year old right hand dominant gentleman who underwent a medium-sized crescent-shaped rotator cuff repair of his non-dominant arm. In this particular case, it was a double row, but I felt I could do it with one anchor medially, one, uh, one suture, one tape, and then bring it out to one lateral row anchor. In this size tear, I will normally start formal PT a little earlier than I would with a larger size tear, so three weeks is when it starts. And he came in at his three-month visit and still having some pain, and having a lot of stiffness. Now, th this is where you know, your experience is gonna play in. Where should they be at three months and where's that red flag? Uh, I thought that he was a little more stiff than I would like, so I performed a subacromial injection. So a bit different than the idiopathic adhesive capsulitis, but you can get those adhesions in that subacromial space. And sometimes this can get them over the hump. He came back at four months and was still pretty much where he was at. So at that point, I'm gonna get an MRI because I wanna know, you know, where are we? Is this an adhesive capsulitis? Is there a retear? Is there loose hardware? What, what is going on? Can you go up one uh, slide, Serena, please? Sure. So at that point, at that four month visit, then I go ahead and get the ultrasound guided glenohumeral injection and get them going again. And he came back at, you know, at about six months and he had improvement with regards to his discomfort from that ultrasound guided injection, but he was still pretty much stuck. So at the seven month mark, uh, that would be three months after his glenohumeral injection, you know, for your small risk of, of uh, increased infection, I felt that we pretty much exhausted conservative management. And at this point, I discussed going in and performing in arthroscopic debridement and release. Again, an important point differentiating this from the previous case. Uh, in this case, you are gonna go into the subacromial space to, to get those adhesions as well. So uh, this was the, a couple pictures from that actual case below. And um, we'll show a video of the way I do it now, but it's, it, there's some good points. Uh, Justin mentioned, I, I actually do everything beach chair except for instability cases and lateral but I'll still do this particular case in beach chair. I think it's easier to do the manipulation as Serena showed before release and then after uh, in this particular case, I think that's good. Um, the radio frequency wand, how aggressive should we be with it versus just arthroscopic uh, scissors? And uh, Bill brought up a point that is my same thought process as a manipulation under anesthesia. If you use the scissors, you can still be pretty, you know, distinct with what you're doing, but are you, are you leaving there and you still have bleeding um, and a small increased risk of scarring? So if I can use the radio frequency device uh, all around, I will. Um, go ahead and show my video. This is not the same case, but this is an example uh, again, that thickened anterior-based tissue. Now, I will tell you that the radio frequency wand I like to use is, is, in, is supposed to have less heating of the water if it's the, the plasma type of, of uh, field that it puts out versus the older, first, uh, earlier generation radio frequency wands that would really heat up the water. Again, what Serena showed, I, I'm the same way. You need to make sure that you get that interval and you need to make sure that you're getting in front of and behind uh, the subscapularis. 
See how thick this is? Uh, I think with a little bit of a pointed tip that this has, you can release and make sure that you, the hood is back behind, protecting the subscap. And here's that, some of those fibers he showed as well. You can start to see the CA ligament, take care of the adhesions in front of the subscapularis, as well as the thickened capsule behind. Now I've switched to anterior. I do do uh, what Bill had mentioned, start up, make sure that cleft is there, and then continue this post posteriorly to connect it. In this particular case, if you can't get all the way down 360, you can use the arthroscopic scissors. If you have a little band that you're uncomfortable with, uh, you can get that with uh, manipulation for that last band that I think uh, uh, Bill has talked about. You would go up into the subacromial space as well, but I thought this video was good, Serena, just to show you uh, a little bit uh, of something different and not using scissors and to bring up some uh, discussion. Uh, go to my next slide because we haven't talked about rehab. I, I do the same thing that I learned from Dr. Warner. I think it's effective in this particular case. I want these patients going hard with physical therapy post-op day one. I think an indwelling interscaling catheter is, is an excellent adjunct because you can get them going. They're not gonna have pain. I'll go five days of PT for the first two weeks, th three days per week for the three and third and fourth week, and then go back to two times per week. Uh, and I think that this is a pretty effective uh, protocol. I think that's a great case. I mean, I think a couple points um, to kind of drive home and, and we'll see if the panel agrees with these statements or not. But, you know, the, the first would be that if patients who are getting stiff at, at six weeks and 12 weeks after surgery um, typically will resolve their stiffness over time. And, you know, while we do see the need for capsule release sometimes, it's uncommon. And if you look at the studies, the likelihood of needing a capsule release after uh, rotator cuff repair is under 5%. Um, so, you know, most patients, you can counsel them that at six weeks and 12 weeks, if they're stiff, they'll catch up with progressive rehab. Um, do most people agree with that st statement? Yeah. Good. Yes. Okay. And I, then... Um, how, many would, how many would inject... If, it, if they were really stiff, at least the subacromial space at three months. If they were painful and a lot stiffer than, than, than you would like. I, I would enjoy, yeah, I, I, oh, go ahead. No, no, I, I was going to say, I, I would just like you did, you did Mike. I think, it, I think the, the studies on injection and rotator cuff are actually really interesting. You know, I think the studies are pretty clear that if you inject someone preoperatively, it increases the risk for re-tear and re-operation. But the studies, and there are some randomized trials that have looked at injection post-surgery for rotator cuff, and they don't, it doesn't seem to influence the outcome, whether you do it at six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, or six months. So, you know, for me, I worry a little bit less about it post-surgery, even though I'm not sure why. And I, I, the only thing I would do differently, Michael, is I would have done an intra-articular injection because while they can have adhesions in the subacromial space, this is a post-op frozen shoulder. You, sh you showed it, you know, that's, that's their pathology. And so you're not likely gonna gain a lot from a subacromial injection, um, even though that may be some of their pain. So I, I would go to the glenohumeral joint and I would wait, uh, but I would have no problem doing it three months. Question for the panelists um, from, the, from one of the fellows. In cases of frozen shoulder after prior rotator cuff repair, do any of the panelists take cultures or synovial biopsies to rule out an indolent infection? Justin, you want to take that one? I was thinking that was a perfect question for you, Serena. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you know, I, I used to, but I don't anymore because with the, with the high rate of um, contamination that we see, um, you know, I worry that I'm going to subject somebody who otherwise wouldn't need it to courses of antibiotics. So I just treat this stiffness and I don't, I don't take cultures for that indication unless there's something on the MRI like lysis around the anchor sites, something that looks like an effusion that doesn't look like just a regular effusion. If there's something unusual about it, I will. But if it just looks like a stiff shoulder um, that otherwise looks benign, then I don't take cultures. I think one of the other things too about this case is that you're going to see this more commonly in these younger patients. Some of the older patients that you'll hold for a long period of time with massive cuff tears just aren't gonna have this happen. And so it's just a pearl that be on the lookout for this more in your younger patients. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, the risk factors that have been, there's a study that looked at the Pearl Diver database with a huge number of rotator cuff repairs. And the patients who ended up having secondary capsular releases were younger patients, female, uh, type 1 diabetes, hypothyroid, and lupus. So those were the risk factors. Um, that was huge data. Um, all right, so I think we've beaten adhesive capsulitis. We have about 10 minutes. So I'd like to do this case, which is a little bit different. So I think, you know, doing another adhesive capsulitis case, people might go crazy. So this is a stiffness case, but it's a little bit um, more interesting, I think, or a little bit different. So this is a 24-year-old right-hand dominant mail truck driver, um, left shoulder stiffness and pain. It's actually a sad story. He was, uh, there was a, a hate crime against him where he was pushed um, on the side of the road in front of a semi truck, he injured his knee and his shoulder, and it happened in California. Um, but he lives in Philadelphia, so he um, had surgery in California. And then I saw him at nine months after his surgery. He, you can see his range of motion is very limited, um, about 80 degrees of elevation. External rotation is zero. And here is X-rays. So, um, uh, Mike, why don't you why don't you tell me what you think? You know, you know, you don't have any operative records. You don't really know what they did, but. But what are you thinking that happened, and, and what do you think about what you're dealing with? Well, I mean, I, based on these screws, it looks like you probably, I would think that he had some type of uh, glenoid fracture, instability, and they tried to put that back down. It's, um, the question is here, is his stiffness just because of there's a number of things. I don't know if this is uh, capsulitis. I mean, it looks like those screws are pretty anterior, so it's going to lock up his, his rotation. There could be some HO, uh, or there is some HO, and it's, uh, I, I would go to a CT scan to, to further define what's, what's exactly going on. Great. So, whoops. So, definitely more complicated than just the capsulitis, like you mentioned. Here's your axial CT. You can see the heterotopic bone and the screws that are near the joint um, probably backed out to a certain extent. There's more of a coronal view. You can see the bridging heterotopic bone inferiorly. And uh, here's a three-dimensional uh, recon, and you can see the heterotopic bone. There's some scatter from the screws, so it doesn't help you too much. Um, so, um, you know, obviously stiffness is, in this case is due to bone and due to contracture. Um, what are you, um, what are you thinking about possibly doing, Justin? Well, I think that this is, gosh, this is a really tough case. I would say, um, a number of different things. Certainly you could always try, and I think that there's nothing wrong with doing this, trying something conservative, you know, seeing, I don't know if we talked about whether or not he's failed injections. Certainly the bone's not going to go away with injections. But I would always start with a non-surgical management option here. I would try that. I would. Okay, see. Justin, he has failed everything. Nice try. That's not okay. happening. All right, Justin, <laughs> right. Justin, he has failed Fair everything, enough. dude. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, so in that case, then I would, I would lay crepe. I would tell him the significant risks of this operation. I would talk to him especially about the neurovascular risks of this surgery. And I would discuss with him uh, that likely, in this case, based on the amount of anterior bone, I would think that you would need to do a subscap takedown because of that bone anteriorly. I don't think you can accomplish what you need to out of a subscap split. And I would consider um, trying to resect, so especially the bone anterior and hopefully inferior, especially identifying the axillary nerve. So basically an extensive HO resection, trying to preserve the joint, preserve the blood supply to the humeral head as much as possible. Great. And, you know, your point about, I think, the subscap is a great one. And that was one of my biggest concerns was this guy's contracted. He has zero degrees of external rotation. And he's previously had some sort of glenoid procedure, which probably violated his subscap. What's his subscap going to look like? And here's an MRI. It's kind of hard to see, but you can, you can appreciate that he's got muscle belly that looks okay, but his actual tendon, it's hard to see. And it's at least very, very thin. So it's another thing to add to your list of things to be worried about during surgery when you're going to do an HO release is, is the subscap going to be something that you can actually repair um, after you take it down? Um, and so, you know, Bill, are there, is there anything you would be prepared to do uh, if the subscap wasn't repairable? 
Well, the first thing is that I'd, I'd be prepared to do an LTO in this case because of that and, and try and try to avoid taking it down again. But if you get in and the subscap is already torn, then obviously that, that's not gonna be a value. Um, you can be prepared to do a transfer uh, of the PEC if, if you had to, and it's a 24 year old and we know the results are not terrific. Um, you can be prepared to augment your subscap repair on the way back out with uh, uh, some form of either allograft or bio, biologic augment. Uh, and then the other technical pearl is that I would definitely have an intraoperative nerve monitor, uh, one of those little disposable nerve devices, because that nerve can be absolutely encased uh, in the uh, heterotopic bone, and that can be a nightmare uh, for trying to differentiate where the nerve is from where the bone is. One, one technical pearl to follow up on what Dr. Levine just said, if you are going to use that, you're going to start, I use a checkpoint, you start on the maximal stimulation and then you, you go down to help localize where the nerve is. That's a great point. Um, so, you know, we'll forge ahead. This is the um, intraoperative motion. You can see how stiff he is. Um, and uh, this is the joint here. This is the subscap, which after the bone, it, most of the subscap was actually bone. And after the bone was resected, this is what's left. And that's the excursion. So you can see the head here. So it really didn't reach. So um, at this point, we um, honestly wasn't sure what to do. So I did uh, uh, an anterior allograft. Um, that's a thick piece of dermis. Those are uh, anchors in the glenoid. Um, and then that allograft is placed um, across the anterior glenoid and um, into the humerus. The subscap, you can see it's repaired here to the mid portion of the allograft. It didn't, it didn't reach back over after everything was resected. And so his, his motion um, and his x-rays are there. You can see that intraoperatively, you know, I didn't stress him too much because I didn't want to screw up my graft, but um, you, know, you can see his motion is, is improved there. And you can see the bone resection on the um, AP and the, and the axillary views. And then his, his result was surprisingly good. Um, so you can see his, his, his motion is better. Um, he's not normal by any stretch. You'll see his abduction. He's still got some limitations. He gets to about 90 degrees, um, but certainly he's, he's better than where he started. Um, so any, any comments? Serena, that's a tough case. I, I would just be curious, um, you know, obviously anything at 24, you're, you're going to try to do anything but arthroplasty. I'm just curious. You know, Boston talks a lot about latissimus transfer because he doesn't believe in pec transfer. What were your thoughts about that, about that concept? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I like to do latissimus transfers for irreparable subscap tears. Um, in his case, I wanted to save that option for later in the event that, um, you know, either this didn't work or that he needed something else done, like an arthroplasty, like a hemiarthroplasty. At least I would have that left. Um, and I was a little bit worried that it might not have the excursion to get to where I needed it to go with this amount of stiffness. So I didn't use it, but um, I think, you know, it's still there if we need it later. Um, I, I so, think, I mean, I think we're, Serena, oh, go ahead. If this is a home run for the, this is a, you know, as, as complex a problem that you're gonna face. Um, the intraoperative findings were exactly predictable um, and, um, you know, I think you, you did what you needed to do, which is uh, you solved his immediate problem. You didn't burn too many bridges for the future. Assuming he doesn't get infected from the, the big allograft, you know, the big dermal graft, then, then this is for sure a home run. Well, uh, Ranjan, if there, if there are no other questions from the um, panel, we're, we're close to um, the time. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to thank everybody for, for joining. I'd like to thank uh, Bill for filling in as both president and, and panelist. Um, I'd like to thank Ranjan and, and Gus, who's not here, and the panelists for, for a great session. So I hope everybody who's a fellow this year has a great year, and everybody who just graduated, um, good luck in starting your practices. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone.